the next talker is a uh, speak speaker is Dr. Marco Kostic, who um, recently uh, got his PhD from UCLA in bioengineering and um, is working with Warren Grunfest, who's one of the uh, um, scientific advisors for Pacific Meso Center as well. And uh, we talked about earlier about the issue of using thermal therapy and uh, I gave some basic information regarding cell cultures and I alluded to the clinical uh, service that we have and actually doing, very actively doing cryoablations almost on a daily uh, basis in these patients, which has been very effective. And so what uh, Dr. Kostik has been doing is actually working on a method to, to bring that to intraoperative application. So he's been doing a lot of the engineering work to do that. So he's going to talk about that today. So as Dr. Cameron mentioned, uh, I'm working basically on a development of uh, design and the development of a clinical cry sprayer for a treatment of a mesothelioma. And first, I would like to acknowledge the support by Pacific Mesothelioma Center and uh, Pacific Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute for their uh, funding support. Uh, our collaborators, Dr. Cameron, uh, Dr. Uh, Claire Cameron, Director of PMC, uh, Dr. Wong, and uh, Dr. Liescu from a PMC team, and then uh, my professor, Warren Grunfest, and uh, the undergraduate students, Eric Jong and uh, Gintara Kirzait. Uh, so basically today I'll talk about uh, a little bit about uh, why we're doing the, the research, the development of this system. Uh, I'll present some problems in uh, our hypothesis for the research. Uh, I'll talk about the, the, our novel cryotherapy system development phases. I'll show you some of the simulations that we completed in uh, initial tests and also our future directions for the system development. So NPM basically claims uh, about uh, two to 3,000 uh, new cases a year. Uh, there are about uh, 2,400 uh, deaths uh, as of uh, 2007. Uh, median survival is about seven to 10 months if untreated and treated patients uh, basically 19 months. Uh, recurrence is a problem. It happens in a 13 to 62 percent in uh, local and then uh, 29 to 56 in uh, distant uh, cases. Time to recurrence is anywhere from 18 months to uh, about 12 years. So uh, current basically treatment is uh, surgery, radiation, and uh, chemotherapy. And uh, surgery basically the extrapolar uh, pneumatectomy uh, is uh, basically uh, have a survival of uh, median survival of 33.8 months for phase one and two and uh, median survival of 10 months for phase three and four uh, cases. Uh, also, there's a PD and uh, uh, basic surgery is uh, usually part of a multimodal therapy. Uh, radiation uh, is not indicated as a primary therapy, but as an adjunct to a, a radical surgery or a palliation of pain. The chemotherapy has very limited effect, uh, uh, what we found in literature, and then uh, we have about a, a phase one and two responses are 13, uh, three to 12% for non-platinum-based agents and uh, 10 to 20 for platinum-based agents. Uh, phase three and four cases, 41% of patients have a uh, 12.1 months and then 17% uh, has a 9.3 months uh, survival. Uh, so the current treatments, uh, based on the literature, basic current treatments have a limited impact on a prognosis of patients with mesothelioma and the principal problem with surgery is that the primary total excision is impossible and the identification of remaining cells cannot be achieved with current techniques. So total eradication of disease can rarely be achieved by surgery alone. Uh, so we hypothesize that if uh, we develop a system that can eradicate residual disease, that it, uh, it will significantly improve the impact of surgery on the outcome of surgical treatment of mesothelioma. So, Basically, we asked what is required for us to accomplish this goal. So based on previous reports in literature, uh, we found that uh, cryotherapy can decrease the recurrence of pleural mesothelium after surgery. And uh, specifically, some studies by Dr. Cameron indicated uh, about uh, in a study of uh, 24 patients, they have a high uh, uh, success rate in showing that cryotherapy is actually a, a, a good potential treatment for uh, recurrent mesothelioma and uh, that mesothelioma cells are sensitive to cold. So susceptibility to freezing suggests that cancer cells that remain after resection 
may be killed using cold gases to freeze the surface of lining of the chest cavity while doing minimal damage to the underlying tissue. Uh, some research suggests that benign lesions require approximately minus 20 to minus 30 Celsius uh, uh, to be uh, destroyed, while malignant lesions require much lower temperatures of minus 35 to minus 50. So we set our target temperature, treatment set temperature is uh, minus 35 degrees Celsius. Um, there's a little bit of an overview, basically you can see all the anatomical structures that we have to deal with during the treatment. So issues that we have to consider when designing this kind of system is the proximity of vital organs and structures while we are basically doing the, the treatment. Uh, what is the depth of thermal penetration when we do apply the, the cryogenic material? Uh, how large is the surface area that we want to treat? And how effective it is, basically our system will be to deliver the cryotherapy or the, the, to reach the target temperature. So with the support from Pacific Meso Foundation, we basically started development of a cryo system that is designed to improve the outcome of surgical treatment of mesothelioma. Our goal was to kill the remaining mesothelioma cells after surgical re resection and uh, to basically reduce the recurrence. To achieve this goal, we basically used a cryo spray of uh, liquid nitrogen, uh, which is directed at a pleural surface to freeze the tissue to about a depth of uh, one millimeter uh, in order to avoid particularly sensitive organs and uh, structures as we saw in the uh, anatomy slide. So this is our current diagram of a, a cross system uh, that will be used for intraoperative use. Uh, the pressure will be about uh, 5 psi. Uh, temperature of liquid nitrogen is minus 196 Celsius. And uh, we're currently using the, the storage of uh, 0.5 liters of uh, liquid nitrogen. So the center of our uh, uh, system is the liquid nitrogen dispenser. Then we have the dis uh, dispensing unit, which consists of a hose, the handle that a surgeon will use to actually uh, apply the cryo, and the nozzle, which actually dispenses the, the liquid nitrogen. Uh, on the back end, basically, we have a flow controller that regulates the dispensing of uh, liquid nitrogen, or power supply for the uh, pressure regulator, which regulates the pressure within the uh, vessel and uh, also power supply for the flow controller. So these are some of the early prototypes of uh, how we envisioned the system, particularly the handle uh, for the stylus type uh, sprayer, and then also our nozzles, where this will be small and medium nozzle, and we would have a large nozzle. And the difference basically between the three nozzles is the surface pattern that they will deliver to the tissue. So the small, we estimate about five millimeter diameter medium surface pattern of about 20 millimeters, and then a large surface pattern is, would be a, over 50 millimeters of, uh, in diameter. So, so far, we've developed the design for the initial cryotherapy system. We explored the initial system design using thermal modeling simulations, and some of the results I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, we characterized flow rates for two prototype nozzles, and then we also conducted the protest system tests on uh, ex vivo tissue samples. So for thermal modeling, we used, we created uh, uh, basically uh, three structures. One was a uh, muscle, uh, bone, and the third one was muscle with bone, but then we also have the fourth scenario where we have muscle in bone, where we actually added the blood flow to simulate the, the actual patient uh, 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 scenario. So uh, we used the, the thermal modeling simulation software, and basically what you see here is the, uh, the propagation of, of uh, temperature when the basically liquid nitrogen is applied to the surface, we decrease the surface temperature by five Celsius each second, and we actually achieved uh, the maximum affected depth in muscle tissue was approximately 3.6 uh, millimeters, and the temperature was uh, at zero C. Uh, our targeted temperature depth was actually recorded at 1.5 millimeters. Um, so for the bone, you will see it's quite different propagation of a, of a, a cold. Uh, maximum effective depth was actually four millimeters, and that was at 10 degrees Celsius. Our target temperature depth was at one millimeter, and uh, we again have the same uh, application of the, of the cryo uh, uh, liquid. Uh, next, we wanted to simulate more of a clinical scenario, so we basically wanted to model the rib cage. Uh, here it says without blood flow, but basically the little circles that you see here, here, 
here and here actually represent the blood vessels where we'll actually, in the last uh, scenario, we'll actually flow the blood, which will actually be at a, a body temperature. And you'll see the difference there. So this is without the blood flow. We see that the temperature propagates, but you can see these small blood vessels at the surface. They don't have any effect because the blood is not actually flowing. So the temperature just propagates. And here, we basically reached our target temperature at uh, 0.5 millimeters, uh, basically the minus 35 C. And the maximum effect of that was 3.5 millimeters. Now when we added the blood flow, which was at 30, uh, 37 degrees Celsius, you can see here how blood vessels basically take away the heat, so they're not allowing as much propagation of the cold in a tissue. So these are just very uh, basic models for thermal propagation that we started with to, so we can better understand how, what to expect basically in a depth profile as well as the surface uh, propagation of the uh, uh, temperature when we applied the liquid nitrogen. So we conducted an ex vivo tissue uh, experiment and so we used the porcelain rib cage we use a thermal camera to record the surface temperatures, and we use thermocouples to record temperature depth profiles in the tissue. Uh, we use two different nozzle types, high and medium flow rates, and uh, we basically use the different exposure times to the cryogenic fluid so we can uh, see how much effect it has on a depth profile. So this is the setup. As you can see, these are the thermocouples. They're actually positioned vertically because we want to get the depth profile. They're needle-based thermocouples. Uh, they're approximately one millimeter from the surface and then one millimeter apart each. So we basically go up to, down to three millimeters in depth from the surface of the, of the uh, uh, tissue. Uh, before going to ex vivo, we actually conducted a nozzle pattern test. As you can see here from a thermal camera, we see that a small nozzle pattern of the deliver of the cold versus the medium nozzle, which delivers a lot more uh, liquid nitrogen uh, to the tissue or to the uh, exterior. Um, so we characterize these two nozzle types just so we can better understand flow rates and how it will actually impact the tissue uh, later on. So these are some of the images uh, during the, uh, our test. Uh, we have a picture-in-picture -picture basically with a thermal imaging superimposed on the uh, regular digital camera image. Uh, and these are all recorded by the same camera at the same time. So these are, um, and you can see here, here's the nozzle, basically the spray of liquid nitrogen coming out right here in the vapor. And you can see it right here also. This is the application site right there. So as you can see, we go down to, in this scenario, we went down to minus 47 uh, degrees Celsius uh, for uh, this application. So these are the results that we achieved basically the, uh, using the small and medium nozzles. Uh, we started, for small nozzles, we started at a 21 degrees Celsius uh, and basically went at five seconds, we recorded the surface temperature after spraying and then we recorded the temperature at a thermocouple one, two, and three and these are basically one, two, and three millimeters below the surface of the, uh, of the application site. Uh, the flow rates for small nozzle, we measured at 0.397 milliliters per second, and at, for a medium nozzle, for, uh, 0.43 basically uh, uh, milliliters per second. Uh, we, on the surface, we universally measured the minus 60 degrees Celsius, uh, measured, as measured with the thermal camera. Uh, however, what's important to notice is that the thermocouple at one millimeter uh, depth uh, showed very little change after five or 10 seconds of application of uh, liquid nitrogen. Basically, only after 20 seconds, we went down to five Celsius, which is still uh, uh, doesn't provide any uh, effect to the healthy tissue. So these are basically initial results that, you know, we believe that with this system, we may be able to uh, avoid the damage to the, those important structures that are uh, underlying the, the anatomy of the treated uh, area. So for the medium nozzle, we have similar profile, uh, but uh, we started with a little bit of a higher temperature of the tissue. So here you will see the actual application of the, in one of the experiments where we actually taking these measurements. Uh, so you can see the, actually the stream of liquid nitrogen coming out. The thermocouples are right there. 
to at a higher temperature, and this is the application site. Uh, so this right here, this is the tissue that we used at the porcine rib cage that I showed earlier. No, no, ex vivo, ex vivo. Ex vivo only, yes. So we only conducted ex vivo experiments. So we had uh, our development challenges. Uh, first one was the, and one of the most difficult challenges was the hose, actually. Uh, because we, we were required to have a very low heat loss, uh, we, the hose actually needed to have sufficient pliability at extremely low temperatures and low weight as to not impede the surgeon's dexterity during the procedure. And uh, we were looking for relatively low cost as well solution. Uh, we devised a hybrid solution using off-the-shelf components and some custom-made parts. So we had uh, our development challenges. Uh, first one was the, and one of the most difficult challenges was the hose actually. Uh, because we, we were required to have a very low heat loss, uh, we, the hose actually needed to have sufficient pliability at extremely low temperatures and low weight as to not impede the surgeon's dexterity during the procedure, and uh, we were looking for relatively low cost as well solution. Uh, we devised a hybrid solution using off-the-shelf components and some custom-made parts, and now we're able to actually uh, successfully transfer the liquid nitrogen uh, basically through the nozzle from the, uh, our tank, from the dispenser, without freezing the, the hose. We used silicone and we used Teflon, which was supposedly rated for a lot lower temperatures, but uh, even Teflon actually froze on us and it became like a solid, like a stainless steel pipe. Uh, we initially we thought we may use the stainless steel braided hose, but those are extremely heavy, so we had to have a special support for the surgeon. So that basically didn't. Uh, we basically threw that idea out of the, uh, from the table. And then uh, we found a, a really neat solution, so that's what we're using, and it's, uh, it's been holding up pretty well, actually. The next challenge that we had was actually the flow control, and it, we're still dealing with this issue, um, uh, is basically the, the requires to have a very fine control of uh, liquid nitrogen flow rates, and it needs to have immediate response to surgeon's input, where we basically place the input from the, on the handle, so the surgeon can actually control finally the flow rates of the based on the, of his assessment of the of the treated area. So current solution, we have a capability to control flow rates at specific steps. Basically, we have discrete steps. Um, the clinical system design, however, should provide continuous control or basically smooth control that is based on thermal camera uh, output. So basically, using Using the thermal image, the surgeon will be able to know how much more flow rate or how less flow rate needs to have for the cryogenic fluid to, uh, to the treated area. And we're presently developing uh, uh, this uh, uh, part of the, of the controls. The next uh, and the third challenge that we had was the pressure regulator uh, because it needed to provide sufficient vessel pressure while ma maintaining safety uh, of the pressurized dispenser. So we needed to have a feedback control based on internal uh, liquid nitrogen tank pressure. We had to still implement our pressure safety valve uh, for the, the rating of the vessel. And operation, it needed to operate at a very low or extremely low temperatures. So we designed a custom-made solution using external pressure digestion system and uh, some of the off-the-shelf uh, safety valves. And uh, we're actually currently in the process of fabricating this solution and uh, we'll be testing it uh, hopefully soon. But uh, in all these, uh, uh, these three challenges, the temperature was the key issue, and uh, the humidity of the air causes a lot of components to actually just freeze solid. Uh, so these three issues we pretty much overcome, but uh, they still need the testing and, and a further development. So for our future directions, uh, what we plan to do is uh, system development-wise, we need to expand simulation models uh, with the data based on our measured uh, ex vivo data uh, that we obtained. Uh, we need to continue characterizing the liquid nitrogen flow rates uh, with different nozzles and different uh, sp uh, spray patterns. We only used uh, two nozzles uh, so far that we characterized. Um, we would like to also develop a, a test system for precise uh, uh, liquid nitrogen flow co rate control, which I just mentioned. And we need to design a larger uh, liquid nitrogen uh, storage tank uh, because 0.5 liters may not be sufficient enough for the, uh, for the duration of the surgery or the treatment during the surgery. Uh, and then uh, 
finally, we need to build a clinically suitable system where we wouldn't need a, a PhD two or two uh, to run the system actually or to operate them. Uh, for proposed experiments, uh, the clinical trials would we would like to test in a chest wall, in uh, animal models, and then uh, humans. Uh, we would also like to look at the cellular investigation of the cryotherapy effects, how they actually affect the, the tissue, and we would like to test the novel fluorescence decay temporal imaging uh, technology, which uh, demonstrated initial quantitative and qualitative differentiation and identification of uh, endogenous fluorophores within the tissue, and it has a good sensitivity and specificity based on a lifetime expected uh, extracted information. So in conclusion, the surgical treatment of mesothelioma has its limitations. Uh, based on a need to improve surgical outcomes, we uh, initial therapy system was designed and developed. Uh, we conducted some computer thermal models that are used to predict the tar uh, target temperature depth and tissue thermal profiles. And we conducted preliminary ex vivo tissue experiments showing us uh, some promising results. Further system development is needed for clinical trials. Uh, cellular investigations for cryotherapy effect are needed so we can better understand the physiological processes that uh, basically go behind the application of our, our uh, cryogenic fluid. Uh, implementation of a novel imaging technique may provide improvements uh, in surgical and cryotherapy treatments. And uh, basically for our animal studies and uh, further system development, uh, we are pending our funding, so. Thank you very much, I'm a little bit uh, Early, but...